Okay, let's get going. So we're in the middle of grading the midterms. We will have them graded in a couple of days and then um, plot the distribution, see how everybody did. It wasn't a short test, as you know, but we think it was thorough and reasonably fair, and we'll have more feedback for you. And you notice in the syllabus there wasn't an explicit 90 to 100A, 80 to 90B, et cetera, because we'll see how the distributions go, if they fit that, and we'll curve things as need be, uh, because this is, again, difficult material readings and uh, not the world's easiest exam. So more on that, uh, but more update Wednesday, and uh, because some sections are tomorrow and some aren't until later in the week, uh, I doubt we can get, we're not going to get the exams, exams back tomorrow, but probably next week in section or next week Monday in lecture. So we're going to quickly move into, now to lecture 10, aggression, which could be a topic not for a developmental psychopathology course, but a biology course or a culture course or sociology. Sometimes you need to fight back. And if you haven't noticed, primate species, including he human species, can be pretty darn aggressive at times. So as with inattentive and impulsive behavior, as with, as we'll talk about, depressed behavior, when is aggression normative and when is it pathological? Is it statistical? Is it moral? Moral aspects to aggression? Is it a fit model, harmful dysfunction? Uh, we'll be talking about that. So if you believe in harmful dysfunction, that model of Wakefield's we talked about way back, Aggression can cause a lot of harm to individuals. Physical injury, psychological injury, if it's abuse, aggression against a young kid, devastation to property. If you've been the victim of violence, you know what I'm talking about. But is aggression harmful to the perpetrator? A lot of aggressive people, a lot of bullies seem to get uh, joy out of this, so they like to dominate. Or is a lot of aggression as harmful to the perpetrator as it is to the victim? Because as we know, aggression can be a risk factor for later depression and even suicide. And if you even think of suicide, suicide is a pretty aggressive act against the self. So internalizing, externalizing dichotomies tend to break down. You have to think of age norms. The most aggressive members of our species are two-year-old boys by sheer number. But it might take many fewer, or even one, super violent act by an older individual to count as super aggressive. Obviously, the movie theater and school shootings have been so much in the news for the last few years. Rare, and maybe the only aggressive act that we know about for that individual, but that might outweigh, obviously, the many smaller acts of aggression in younger kids. So the big question is, aggression is harmful. We don't like to be aggressed against. It's statistically, socially deviant. But when is it really a dysfunction? When is aggression OK to fight back with, and when does it signal there's some other psychopathological processes in the perpetrator? So talk, talk, definitions. Externalizing is the broad term. It includes impulsive and hyperactive and delinquent and aggressive behaviors, as opposed to internalizing. We talked about that a couple of times. Another term is antisocial behavior. So this is really the social norm, social deviance model, because it's behavior that goes against social norms. And that could include truancy all the way to murder. So externalizing is probably the broadest term, because it includes hyperactive and impulsive behavior, too. Antisocial is a very broad term, because you could be antisocial in a non-aggressive as well as aggressive format. You could be antisocial relationally by tattling against or excluding a peer, it's a pretty antisocial thing to do, but you're not actually using fisticuffs against the person. Now, what's delinquency, this third term? That's a legal term. You're delinquent if you get caught. So many people who commit the same behaviors as so-called delinquent kids aren't delinquent because they either escape detection or they got let off easy. So delinquency, because it's a legal term, now it involves surveillance and maybe racial profiling and which laws in a given society apply to make certain things legal versus illegal. So delinquency is a big topic of study, but it's not just the same as externalizing or antisocial. Now let's talk about aggression. Sometimes we say this is overt aggression. Bam, sock, pow, spit, gouge, mixed martial arts, aggression. You could do this physically, but you could also do it verbally. You can cuss somebody out. You can cut them to shreds verbally. That's a form of aggression, too. And an important distinction, a lot of aggression is reactive. You're going to fight me. Sucker, well, I'm going to fight you. You respond. And some is proactive. The bully initiates. It's a distinction we'll talk about in a few minutes. Another form of antisocial behavior that's not aggressive is sometimes called covert. Are you ripping somebody off? Are you lying about your performance in this test or on your transcript? And there's been New York Times stories recently about even more forgers and people who fake transcripts to get big jobs. Substance abuse is sometimes considered a form of covert antisocial behavior. Now, it might be overt if you're assaulting someone to get money robbing them for drugs, but a lot of drug use does not involve that. But is it antisocial if it only harms you? But it does break the law, unless it's alcohol and tobacco. But alcohol and tobacco are the two worst substances in terms of lethality, as we'll talk about next time. So the whole range of covert antisocial behavior <coughs> excuse me, has another dimension. And I mentioned before, but it'll have its own category. What about relational aggression? You're not fighting somebody. You're not even directly confronting them. But you're using the peer group to get back at them. Turns out girls, middle school girls, are really good at this. But boys are no slouches either. Think about the ways you could get even with someone or exclude them without having to confront them directly, ruining reputations, excluding them from the group you're with, etc. So these are terms that will be important. What about the DSM? Are there categories? There are, and there's two main ones for kids. One is called oppositional defiant disorder. Now, this one's criticized by the critics of DSM all the time. You mean if a five-year-old boy disobeys and is ornery and cusses, that's a mental disorder? That's a mental illness? That's, a, the critics would say, that's an extreme example of the psychiatrist labeling what is sort of normative boy behavior. And what would the advocates say? If you're way above the norms, if you're a five-year-old boy or a five-year-old girl for that matter, who is particularly ornery and particularly rule-breaking, a lot of the time that predicts, through heterotypic continuity, some pretty serious problems later on, like delinquency, like more overt forms of antisocial behavior. So the debate is, are we labeling boyhood or socially deviant behavior, or are we showing early identification of some antisocial behaviors that we'd be glad to be caught at age 5 rather than waiting until age 10 or 15? Conduct disorder is much more severe. Now, there's a lot of symptoms of conduct disorder. Some of them are overt aggression. Some of them are covert. Some of them are on the delinquency legal side, running away truancy, etc. And you know this is a heterogeneous category because if it only requires a few out of these many symptoms, there's a lot of combinations of how those could get together. Some are overt, some are covert. But there's serious antisocial actions. Many kids, but not all, with ODD graduate a few years later into conduct disorder. Now they're assaulting others, physically or sexually. Or now they're doing major robbery or burglary. So we say, unless 
you're just utterly abjectly poor and doing this to survive, or unless you're just following the social norm of a group, that's the mental disorder called conduct disorder. These are much more serious antisocial behaviors. As we'll talk about, it makes a big difference if you start to exhibit these behaviors when you're six, seven, eight, nine, or 10, versus if you start to exhibit them when you're a preteen or teen. There's, so there's something about real early in childhood conduct disorder that seems to be different from a more normative adolescent conduct disorder. So stay tuned for that. So how many kids who meet the criteria for oppositional defiant disorder, this controversial disorder of young kids, go on to actually have, a few years later, a much more aggressive conduct disorder? Before we answer that, we'll say, if it's not very many, if only 10% do, why do we leave ODD in the DSM? It's overlabeling kids who will start to adjust. But if it's a much higher percentage, man, we better have ODD in there because we don't want to wait until the kids are already on their way to juvenile hall before we label them. So that's the big issue. So what, what's a false positive? That's if you say something's a problem, but it's really not. What's a false negative? That's when you say, oh, it's fine, but it's really a problem. Which is the worst problem in labeling a kid as having ODD? Is it the false positive saying he's really got a disorder when he doesn't, or a false negative kind of missing the boat when the kid, you say no problem, but the kid ends up at age 15 in juvenile hall? What do you think is the worst problem? I heard first one, second one, first one, second one. Nobody knows. I mean, it's debatable, isn't it? I want to know if I could identify a kid who's going to be delinquent much earlier because I could intervene. Boy, I don't want to have a false negative. But what about the kid who gets a label of a mental illness in kindergarten, and it turns out, well, the family was arguing a lot. This was sort of normative, and the kid ends up pretty fine by second, third grade. Now that's a false positive. I've overlabeled. That's stigmatizing. You've got a permanent thing in the kid's record. Both things are pretty terrible. Now, in medicine, what's a pap smear, right? What, what about mammograms in the news for women's health? If you've got a medical screener against a condition that could be a killer, what do you have to avoid? You can't have a false negative. You've got to detect it early. It's too late later, right? But what's the trade-off? To get a lot of those cases, you have to set the threshold low enough that what are you bound to have in return? You're bound to have some false positives. So the argument is, woman gets a positive result on a pap smear, panics, goes and sees the gynecologist who does more tests and says, no, it was a false alarm. It's scary, but whew, that's okay. Because you didn't want the alternative to wake up three years later with cervical cancer. So we can't have false negatives in medicine, the thinking goes. But in developmental psychopathology, you could argue it's just as bad, if not worse, to have a false positive, because now you've got this label in the kid's record. So you have to really think about, is it a bigger problem to miss the boat, or is it a bigger problem to falsely say this kid's got a label when he or she shouldn't have? Big issue. Risk factors for ODD, why these kids get pretty ornery, might not be the same ones that actually say, well, when does ODD progress to CD? So what predicts the early symptoms may not be the same factors that predict the maintenance of those symptoms over time. So we'll talk more about that as we go. So before we get into some of the numbers, if you are in the ballpark of ODD or CD, you've got pretty serious aggression problems. You don't do very well in school a lot of the time. ODD and CD are risk factors for poor school achievement. But it turns out that we've got to take into account ADHD, because ADHD is actually a bigger predictor of school problems than is aggressive behavior. And if you take into account ADHD, ODD and CD might even be spurious risk factors. So you've got to assess not only is the kid aggressive, but can the kid pay attention and focus and show inhibition. There's a lot of research on what goes on inside the minds of kids who are pretty aggressive. It's not just behaviorist stimulus response, oh, the kid got frustrated and now acts out. There might be a lot of thinking processes involved. Like, hmm, I'm in the lunchroom, and I got that little shove behind with my tray, and I spill my milk. Was that an accident, or did, did that sucker push me? So you've got to make a decision about whether something bad that happens, was that an accident? Oh, I'll forgive it, or were they out to, to do me in? So you have to process information, you have to make an interpretation about it. It turns out that lots of kids who fall into the ODD and CD camp automatically make the assumption if something bad happens, they meant it. We call it the hostile attribution bias. This will show up on another slide. They meant it, didn't they? So I've got to now proactively strike back. But maybe it was an accident. It's another false positive, false negative in a different context, right? So a lot of research on aggression these days is trying to figure out how kids process the social world around them, make interpretations about whether this was intentionally harmful or not, and then make decisions about whether to cool their jets or fight back. So achievement in school is a big issue, social processing, cognitive social processing, and peer relationships. Kids with ADHD get rejected. We talked about that. What about kids with ADHD who also have this thing called ODD? They tend to be explosive. They tend to get in a hissy fit at the least provocation. Those are the most rejected kids of all because their aggressive behavior is pretty impulsive. The birthday candles blown out, that wasn't aggressive, that was just an impulsive mistake, but they tend to be explosive and retaliatory a lot. That's what other kids don't like. If you're really proactive in your aggression, you're planful, I'm a bully, I decide when to mete out punishment, you tend to be, as we talked about before, sociometrically controversial. A lot of kids say, awesome, cool, what a leader. Other kids say, I'm scared of shit of this kid. And other kids are too afraid to say that they don't like the kid. So there's a, there's a mix of positive and negative regard. What about family factors? What is the one area where shared environmental factors actually explain some of the bell curve of behavior? Externalizing antisocial behavior. Either authoritarian parenting, Harsh limits, not much warmth, or super permissive parenting. Anything goes, just make sure the house is standing when I come home from work. Either extreme is associated with externalizing antisocial behavior. And remember, coercion, if you look in real time, the family is alternately too permissive and then too authoritarian within an afternoon. <clears throat> you let it go, you let it slide, and then bam, the kid crosses the line, and you whack the kid. So it's probably a mistake to say some families are either all permissive or all authoritarian. There can be these interesting blends of both. But again, is the family causing that behavior, or is the family reacting to a kid who came out the shoot with a difficult temperament and maybe had early ADHD? So it's reciprocal. It's bidirectional. It's transactional. A risk factor for aggression is low social class, being born into poverty. Many rich kids are aggressive, but on average, poverty is a risk factor. But, even in examples on our test, maybe poverty over here and aggression over here is explained by mediated by other factors. And the prime mediating factor in much research is parenting. SES contributes to aggression largely through the fact that low SES families tend to be either too permissive or too authoritarian, and those are the more proximate mediating factors. They're probably the better explanations of aggressive behavior. 
So this is a famous study. The study is done by Moffat, and Moffat's married to Caspi, and we all read Caspi et al., and we'll know forever what a gene environment interaction is, and they've done a lot of their research, in fact, some of the gene environment interaction research, in this town in New Zealand called Dunedin. And back 42 or three years ago, every kid born in this town automatically enrolled in a study. So it wasn't a sample, it was every kid born in that year in the town, and they just finished their 40th year follow-up, and I think they got 97% of the sample to participate. A few kids were dead, and everybody else participated, because nobody moves from Dunedin, New Zealand. So it's been the subject of a lot of studies, because when the kids were teens, they got blood, and they figured out their DNA wasn't, DNA doesn't change, and gene environment interaction. Moffat has followed, they start at age three, every two years they do a major full day assessment. And Moffat says, you know, if you really look carefully, by, not starting at age three, but by age 15, 17, 19, if you do the crime statistics for the city, about 5% of the kids are responsible for about 50% of the crime, which is true not just in New Zealand, but in the United States and most other countries. A small group of kids wreaks havoc. Now she looked and said, who are those kids? And they're the kids who, at age three, had really difficult temperaments. And by age five, their kindergarten teachers said, really high ADHD symptoms, really high ODD symptoms. And by age 11, the middle school teachers were saying, holy shit, we can barely keep this kid in the classroom. There was a pattern. Externalizing behavior started early in this group, turns out to be about 5% of the boys in the sample, and just literally a few girls, under 1% of the girls. And by the time they were teens, they were clearly the most violent, and they were responsible again for over 50% of the crime. So what did Moffat call this group? They're the early onset group, not just before 10, but you could pick them out before 5. And in many of her articles, she said, this is the life course persistent group. Because as they follow these kids beyond the teen years, these are kids in their 20s, who weren't kids anymore, who were doing what? Lots of spouse abuse and partner abuse, and lots of adult crime. So the idea is, if you get in this trajectory early, it's hard to get out of it. The early starter, life course persistent group. This is the group that you could put in the dictionary under heterotypic continuity. This would be the group you'd, you'd feature because they were the ones with really difficult temperament at three. And they were the ones cussing out the preschool and kindergarten teachers. And they were, they were the ones initiating fights and reacting with fights in elementary school. And they were sexually assaulting girls in high school. And then starting to get into robbery and then partner abuse in the 20s. So it wasn't the same behavior. It was this unfolding of an antisocial set of behaviors over time. Moffat says, and we'll talk about this in a minute, this group has a mental disorder. If you've got all these signs and risk factors starting at three, this isn't just social deviance. You've got some problems that you need treatment. Yes. Well, see, the problem, yeah, good question, what about the girls? There's very few of them. Did they manifest in the same way? And there's a lot of research on girls don't start as early as boys because they're more verbal at three. It may take more risk factors and girls' antisocial behavior may not show up until later, but at that point, Moffat says they've got the same risk factors as the boys did, but you've got to wait a few more years to see it. That's a huge question and a good one, but it's, I think the jury would say now, girls have pretty similar risk factors, but you've got to wait a few more years before you see this behavior emerge. Now, what's the alternative? If you go in adolescence, forget this early starter group. What happens by age 13 and 15? Almost half the boys in Dunedin, New Zealand, could have been labeled as delinquent. They're joyriding, they're using drugs early sex, they're fighting other kids, and about a third of the girls too. The girls are different in one way, they never tended to use weapons or engage in the most severe violence. But almost everything else, what happens in the early teen years? It's like the genie comes out of the bottle and the whole town kind of went nuts, right, with a lot of antisocial behavior. So Moffat said, if you subtract out of this group, that 5% of boys and under 1% of girls, it's almost normal, it's statistically normative for a lot of teens to engage in a lot of antisocial behavior. And what happens to them when they hit 21, 23, 25? holy shit, I should actually get that GED, or maybe think about college, or get a job, or my partner's pregnant. You kind of get your act together. So her name for this group is an adolescence limited group of people with antisocial behavior. Now, what risk factors do they have? Difficult temperament when they're young? No. Aggressive in kindergarten? No. School problems in first and third grade? No. They didn't have any early signs of pathology. This is what you would call a normative thing. But why? Well, everybody's worrying about this around the world. Moffat's theory is it's because of the maturity gap. When do you get sexually mature these days? If you're a girl, about 12, or often much younger, compared to age 15 a century ago, for a boy about a year later. So you start adolescence before you're even a teenager, and when does adolescence end? When do you get full maturity, educationally and economically? It takes forever now, right? So you've got this long period of adolescence where you see advertisements, and you see older kids doing all kinds of cool things, and you can't do it. What's the best way to do it? Become antisocial. You too can joyride. You too can have drugs. You too can have sex. So her idea is this is kind of a modeling of this sort of maturity need from young teens who don't have the equipment otherwise to do it. But it's almost normal, because the percentages are so high. Make sense? There's some interesting stuff, though. Moffat and her team have followed these people now into their late 20s and 30s. What happened to a lot of the so-called adolescence-limited kids? Well, pardon my French, maybe you knocked a gal up. Or maybe you got caught when you were 15 and ended up in New Zealand Juvenile Hall. Or maybe you got kicked out of high school and were never invited back. Even though you didn't have these early risk factors, you got snared. Some of the consequences of this adolescent-limited antisocial behavior makes it likely in some cases that you don't all of a sudden shape up at 21 or 23. So as Moffat has modified her theory, the adolescence-limited group probably is better called an adolescent-onset group. Because 